All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to another Real Talk with Nana show. And I really want to thank all of you. Thank all of you for joining us. And um, I want you to invite some, I mean, a friend or anybody you can just to join this program. Um, I want to start by acknowledging, I don't know where, where you're watching from, but I want to acknowledge all of you who have taken your, I mean, took, chosen your Sunday evening to join us here. My guest tonight, as all of you know who've tuned in tonight, my guest tonight is a renowned legal practitioner. He's a, he's, um, a professor of public law and he's a proud native of, of, of the beautiful country of Kenya. Professor Patrick Lumumba is well known across the African continent as one who speaks truth to power. He's an African giant, he's a living legend, he's a role model. To some, he's even a president you know, um, of, of a country with no borders. We respect this man, he's loved by many across the continent. Professor Patrick Lumumba is, 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 a, is, is, is a drum major for justice. He's, he's a strong advocate for good governance and he's a trumpet for anti-corruption. Um, he's an ardent and an enthusiastic campaigner for human rights. Most of you know he's a fearless fighter, he's an igniter and he's a writer. Prof has authored and co-authored several books. Recently, he has even ventured into fiction, um, the, 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 the Stolen Moment, which I think tonight I'm going to ask for copies of those books for some of our subscribers. Prof is a man of peace and humility, uh, but when he speaks, as we know, he spits revolutionary rhetorics that seeks to dismantle systems that have been created um, for, to, to produce injustices and corruption. Tonight, we are blessed to have Professor Patrick Lumumba. He's also a voice of the voiceless crying in the wilderness against the current unfair and discriminatory policies that has been shoved on, 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 on the throat of Mother Africa. Tonight, we are really blessed to have this African statesman, somebody we all look up to, Professor Patrick um, Lumumba. Please welcome Professor Patrick Lumumba. Please welcome, think, Professor. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Our... Thank you very much for inviting me to this forum. I'm glad to be with you this evening and look forward to a conversation on Thank the very so topical much. subject of slavery and colonization and its impact on the peoples of Africa. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Mm. Yes, so, um, I, I know we are, we're going to go into it, but I think we, on Friday we were talking about, and we, all, we are all touched by what is happening in Nigeria. Prof, um, um, do you want to make any comments for our brothers, our sisters, the, the struggle, the challenge? We know people have lost their lives. And um, as an African statesman, do you want to say anything to what is happening in our sister country? First, let me start by conveying my very heartful condolences uh, to those who have lost their lives in what must now be characterized as the Lekki Massacre. Hmm. I'm also aware uh, that lives have been lost in different cities in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. It is sad that that has had to happen because young men and women across Nigeria came out hmm. without fear to communicate to the administration of the Federal Republic about an organization or an arm of the police that had gone rogue. Yes. And it is instructive that the president of the Federal Republic, General Muhammad Buhari, mm -hmm. has himself admitted that that particular arm of the police had gone rogue. Mm -hmm. The vice president of Sinbajo has also said the same thing. The opposition leader, Atiku Abubakar has also said something about and against it. The former president, Olusha Gunobasanjo, has also, spoke, has also spoken. Henry Akubu Gowan has spoken. Good luck, Jonathan, has spoken. And the message is clear that the people of Nigeria have been victimized. And I urge the administration of President Buhari 
to lend a listening ear to the young men and women who are speaking firmly and clearly. And they must not be judged on the basis of the activities of the fifth columnists who have infiltrated an otherwise peaceful process and visited pain upon the people of Nigeria. My message is injustice must be fought with the firmness that opens the eyes of those who are in positions of power. And that secondly, it is incumbent upon the administration to ensure that those who have infiltrated the struggle are isolated and dealt with firmly and swiftly. I've always said that Nigeria is indeed the very heart of the continent of Africa. One in every five Africans is a Nigerian and Nigerians are to be found everywhere in the diaspora, great men and women who must be respected. What we need to do is to create an environment where Nigerians, wherever they are, can contribute to their country and by extension to the continent of Africa. If Africa is to be great, Nigeria must be great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. That is a very mm. profound statement. Thank mm. you so much. Um, mm. Before we go into the main topic that everyone is waiting to hear tonight, how slavery and colonization is impacting the continent today, years after you know, everything is ended. Um, just on a light question, um, you have a very profound name, um, Patrick Lumumba, which is very... Um, it has, it's similar to the, the, the first president of the Republic of Congo. Can you, can you share with us the history behind this name? And then we go to our topic. <laughs> Patrice Emery Lumumba yeah. was a Congolese freedom fighter. And as you know, the first prime minister of the Republic of Congo now known as the Democratic Republic of Congo. Patrice Emery's greatest claim to fame is that he was fearless, is that he was a patriot, is that he was a pan-Africanist, is that he was clear in his agenda against the erstwhile colonizers, the Belgians. His other claim to fame is that within nine months of his entry into office, he had become a victim of the diabolical machinations we now know of the Belgians and the Americans. And that these powers had used individuals within his own administration, including individuals such as Moise Chombe, Joseph Kasavubu and Joseph Desire Mobutu, who later became Mobutu Seseseko. And he was assassinated. And the only thing that remained of him was a set of his teeth, which is still resident in Brussels in Belgium. It is therefore instructive that many a parent named their children in memory of Patrice Emery Lumumba. I was one such as those who are meant to immortalize Patrice Emery. And we continue to live and to survive by God's grace, giving testament to what Patrice Emery would have lived for. That is the genesis of our name. Wow. Thank you so much, Prof. Thanks for the summary. And now mm. we go to the main topic for today. Prof, tell us how slavery and colonization, which took place in Africa, we all know, is still impacting us today. Uh, Prof, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, let me start by saying that Africa is the mother continent. Historians, from different uh, dispensations will tell you 
that humanity originated from this continent. But we also know that this continent has been the victim of diabolical machinations from the European powers. History records that is the Portuguese who started trading with Africa and they did so with the Western part of Africa. In the early years, the Portuguese came and the Africans as accommodating as they are, allowed them to trade. They traded in many things, including gold and other precious metals. But their greed soon overtook them. And when the greed overtook them, they came and to a certain extent did collaborate with certain African chiefs or African leaders, and they commodified the African. So that many Africans were taken, some may say, uprooted from the Aboriginal homes and spirited away to parts of the world that were then under the control of the Portuguese. So the Africans were taken out and taken to places such as Cape Verde or Cabo Verde. And as the Portuguese moved down south, as some of their sons, uh, such as Vasco da Gama were moving, looking to India, they found lands in Equatorial Guinea or Sao Tome and Principe. They went to Angola. They went, even before they got to Angola, they went to Guinea-Bissau. Ultimately, they found themselves in Mozambique and took Africans and spirited them away to their colonies in Brazil and other parts of the world. Soon, it was not only the Portuguese. We had the English, we had the French, we had the Spaniards, we had the Belgians, we had the Germans, we had the Dutch, we had the Danes. And what they did to our forefathers is that they commodified us. They turned us to, into things, they dehumanized us in the eyes of the slave master. If you killed an African, that did not constitute the offense of murder because an African was a thing that could be murdered or killed without any consequence. Thomas Deckerson writing in his book, Or Porto, tells us how these individuals came into the hinterland of the Africa or the continent of Africa and how they made brother to rise against brother, how they encouraged chiefs within the African communities to capture their very own and to sell them to the Portuguese and subsequently to other civilizations. The net effect of this is that the African was dehumanized. The net effect of this was that the Africa was made into a thing. The net effect of this is that Africans were made to believe that they were children of a lesser God. You only have to watch the dramatization that has been made into the film Roots. In the film Roots, what is demonstrated is how Africans were removed and uprooted from their very being and taken to different parts of the world, the United States included. Alex Haley in his book Roots talks of a young man Kunta Kinte, 
from the village of Jufure in the Gambia, who is taken away. And when he is taken away, he survives. And one of the things that the slave master did was to beat your name out of you so that Kunta Kinte is forced to answer to the name Toby. And he did not stop there. Kunta Kinte is made to believe that he is a lesser human being. Slavery in a nutshell was the beginning of the dehumanization of the African. When slavery lost its luster, the Europeans once again instituted yet another pernicious project, the colonization project. And you remember what they did, these colonizers? They sat in Berlin in 1884 and 1885. And they divided Africa into different spheres of influence. The Germans had their peace. In Southwest Africa, now Namibia, they had their peace in Dahomey. And you remember that the first genocide of the 20th century was the killing of the Herero in Namibia. And it's not the Germans who had their peace, the French had their peace. They had their sphere of influence in Senegal, in Mauritania, in Mali, in La Côte d'Ivoire, in Upper Volta, now renamed courtesy of Thomas Sankara as Burkina Faso, in Central African Republic, in Chad, in Gabon, in Benin, in Togo, the French had their peace. The English had their peace in Sierra Leone, in Gold Coast, now known as Ghana, in the Gambia, in Kenya, in Uganda, in Yasaland, now known as Malawi, in Northern Rhodesia, now known as Zambia, in Southern Rhodesia, now known as Zimbabwe, in British Somaliland, in the Sudan, the British were there. Tanganyika they acquired as a trust territory because Tanganyika and Rwanda Urundi were under the tutelage of the Germans until the war. The Belgians had the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Spaniards had Equatorial Guinea. Africa had been parceled out. And the key feature of the colonial project was that Africans were treated as second class citizens. But even then, Africans started to rise. And I remember so very distinctly that the African agenda was informed by Africans in the diaspora. People like Marcus Garvey, people like W.E.B. Du Bois. I remember the speech that was delivered in the month of April 1906 by the great South African Pixley Kaisa Kaseme when he talked about the regeneration of Africa. So that even when slavery was alive and well, even when colonization was alive and well, Africans were always conscious of the fact that they had to regain their independence. The entire independence movement was informed by the recognition and the realization of Africans that we were not children of a lesser God. So that in the 1950s, we begin to see a new wave. The British have lost the war. The French have lost the war. The Germans have lost the war. 
All Europe have lost out. There is a new hegemon in the arena, the United States of America. The world sits, the world as it was then known, sits in 1945 in San Francisco in the United States of America and comes up with the United Nations Charter in which it is recognized that all men are born equal. And they sit again three years later in Paris, France, and they come up with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And once again, they reiterate that all men are born equal. During that period, the Indians led by Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, otherwise known as Mahatma Gandhi, are also agitating for independence. Simultaneously, great African leaders such as the Osagie for Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Kambarage Nyerere, Modibo Keita, Ahmed Seko Ture, Ahmed Ben Bella, Gamal Abdel Nasser, Kenneth Kaunda, and many others I, in the forefront of the struggle for independence, and come the year 1957, Ghana regains our independence, but I can remember so very vividly and distinctly those immortal words of the Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma, that the independence of Ghana means nothing until the rest of Africa is free. But no sooner have we regained our independence than the neo-colonial project comes because the erstwhile colonizer did not leave willingly. So the neo-colonial project is alive and well. And Nukuruma warns the Africans, he first warns Africans in 1958 in Accra, Ghana, telling them to be vigilant. He does the same thing in Casablanca, Morocco, telling them we must unite because without unity, we are going nowhere. And he does not stop there. In 1963, on the 24th day of May in Addis Ababa, or Ethiopia, he once again reminds Africans that we must unite because if we don't unite, we will be subdued by these erstwhile colonizers. But who listen to the Osagi effort? None. So we create a weak organization called the Organization of African Unity. The net effect is that immediately we regain our independence. The erstwhile colonizer is in the business of creating an environment that is designed to ensure that the post-independent African countries are not without the concern of the erstwhile colonizer and are perennially involved in conflict. So as early as 1961, the Belgians working closely with the Americans have ensured that Patrice Emery Lumumba is removed from power and is assassinated. Two years later in Togo, Silvanus Olympio is murdered. Three years later, the Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma is overthrown. One year later, Nambi Azikiwe, Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, and the Sodana of Sokoto, Ahmadu Bello, are also eliminated in a coup d'etat. And after that, we see the removal from power of people such as Modibo Keita in Mali. And we see coup after coup or mutinies across the continent of Africa. And we see how the erstwhile colonizer remain in the African scene. The Portuguese colonies of Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, Angola, and Cape Verde remain under the clutches of the colonizer until the 1980s. Southern Rhodesia, which we now call Zimbabwe, remains under the clutches of Ian Smith 
with the support of their cousins in Europe and America until the 1980s. Namibia and South Africa remain under the apartheid regime until the 1990s. Begging the question, what has been the impact of colonization and slavery on us? The project is still alive and well in a very subtle way. The Europeans still rule the roost. The French are still very present in their former colonies. The British in a very subtle way and an organization called the Commonwealth are still very present. And there are new kids in the block. The Americans are the new hegemons after the World War II. And I speak, as I speak to you now, the Chinese are also present. So Africa is not at ease. Africa is not at ease because she has never been allowed to settle. Africa is not at ease because the erstwhile colonial powers are still manipulating those in positions of political power in a very surreptitious manner. The French are still present in their former colonies. Africa is not at ease because international diplomacy is still against us. Africa is not at ease because we still do not tell our story. Africa is not at ease because we have still been made to believe that we are children of a lesser God. Africa is not at ease. So one could say that the entire project of slavery, which was succeeded by the project of colonialism, which was succeeded by the project of neocolonialism, has had a grave and devastating impact on the African psyche. But we will not stop there because Africans have now recognized that going forward, we must do things that are in our best interest. Those activities are not as they should be. But when I hear Africa talking about Agenda 2063, even I, when I think that the AU is a lame duck body, a lethargic body, I know that we are thinking in the right way. When I see that the Africa continent of free trade area is designed to eliminate trade barriers, I know that Africa is headed in the right direction. So we may have lamented for too long. We may have suffered for too long. We may have been humiliated for too long. We may have been abused for too long. We may have been led in the wrong path for too long but we have come of age. And today we are defying the after effects of colonization, slavery, and neocolonialism. We are in a good space. And I can assure you that Africa is moving because there is a new dawn. I can see a new light at the end of the tunnel. And the beauty of that light is that it heralds a new dawn not the coming of a train which will crush us. That is all I wish to say. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you so much. Um, you know, you, I mean, it's so good to have an African statesman talk about this in a way. And I know there are young people are across the globe listening to you. Um, quite recently, um, Prince Harry um, made a comment that the Commonwealth must acknowledge the past, even if it's uncomfortable. Um, Prof, what are your thoughts on these words? Um, is this something to be considered? You know, the British, as indeed other colonizers have been in the business of being very patronizing towards us. Princess Henry is a very young man who has no sense of history. But to the extent that he has now acknowledged that his forefathers visited pain upon us, that is a good development. What I would want to hear is a statement from his grandmother. 
His grandmother became the Queen of England in 1952 when no African country was independent. I would want to hear an unequivocal an statement from the Queen of England, who is Princess Harry's grandmother, telling us that they have apologized for slavery and for colonization. That is what I'm waiting to hear. And bodies such as the Commonwealth, these are vestiges of colonization which gives a sense of pride to the British, Britannia rules the waves. And this is a kingdom or an empire over which the sun never sets. We must re-examine the Commonwealth and what is true import and purpose is. I'm waiting for an apology from Queen Elizabeth II. Wow. Well, um, <laughs> that, that brings me to my next question, Prof. Um, just wanted to um, ask, you know what, there are people who think there were Africans who were complicit in the slave trade during colonization. You know, in, in the West, a lot of statues have been toppled, but truth be told, there were Africans who actually helped other Africans to go through this. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Because whilst we are toppling statues, I mean, where, I mean, where do we take the blame for the things we did for, 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 for the parts of the history that is hurting us today? I don't, yeah. You are very right. And, and if you go to Ghana at the Cape Coast cast, uh, Castle at Cape Coast, the African, uh, there is an apology. There is a plaque there that says that we apologize for the negative role that we played in perpetuating slavery. But you must remember that those who perpetuated slavery were themselves victims of the diabolical machinations of the British and the Portuguese and all these. It is the Portuguese and the British who left their land and came to the continent of Africa and commodified Africans. So this idea that they want to make Africans have a false sense of guilt is misguided. It's true that they were manipulated and then uh, uh, participated in the process. But remember that the philosophical and strategic approach of the British was divide and rule. So they came here in the continent of Africa to divide us that they may rule us. So the guilt must rest with the British. The French on their part came with the approach of assimilation and they made the African believe that the best thing that could happen to one is for one to believe that they were French. So when all is said and done, I don't think we should feel guilty. It is them who came, divided us, made us believe that our brothers were commodities, forced us to capture our brothers, forced us to pay taxes, forced us to abuse our brothers. You do not blame the puppet, you blame the puppeteer. They can never escape this guilt. Even God in high heaven knows that of his children, these children of the fairer race, fair in terms of complexion, have been the most abusive throughout history. The blacks, have been the most accommodating of all God's children. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, wow. Wow, I can't. <laughs> Prof, that's so deep. Um, I'm going to ask you the one last question and then I'm going to bring Abigail in and she's going to bring a few questions coming from our listeners. Prof, um, we know Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream for the black people of America. You are an African statesman. If I ask you, what's your dream for Africa? What's your dream for our young people? What's your, what's your dream for your grandchildren? I mean, the future of Africa, um, how would you encapsulate it as, as, a, as an African statesman? What's your dream for the continent of the new generation coming? I look to a continent that has pride in ourselves. Mm. I look to a continent whose sons and daughters 
believe in themselves, whose sons and daughters have exercised the ghost of inferiority complex. I look to a continent which is self-sufficient. I look to a continent that will feed herself. I look to a continent whose sons and daughters will no longer cross the Mediterranean Sea. I look to a continent whose sons and daughters will not be humiliated at the embassies of France or the United States of America in search of visas. I look to a continent whose sons and daughters will be comfortable in their skin. I look to a continent whose daughters will no longer bleach their skins. I look to a continent whose daughters will no longer wear wigs from dead human beings in Asia and the United States of America. I look to a continent whose sons and daughters will believe that they are capable of realizing what is up and available to them. I look to a continent where there'll be innovators and inventors. I look to a continent that will sit at the dinner table of human civilization, not apologetically, but as people who are deserving. That is the continent that I envisage. And I believe that that continent is coming, a continent whose sons and daughters will be proud and will make her proud. That continent is coming. That is Mother Africa. I want to tell you, Prof, I am so happy and I really like what you've just said. And I'm telling you that today you have spoken history. The words you have spoken here will be written and it will be given to our generations to read. Just as today we can recite the words of Martin Luther's dream, his dream for his four little children, your dream for this continent, the young people of this continent, this, your statement you've made here will be remembered in history. Thank you so much, Abigail. I don't know if you've got any questions for, um, from, from our audience. Um, Abigail, have you got any questions for Prof? Please unmute, unmute, Abigail. Hi, Professor, thank you so much for your wise and inspiring words, honestly, and I agree with the sentiment um, that Nana just said. Those words will be etched in history, um, and I'm glad to have been here to, to experience them. We have a lot of questions from YouTube, so I'll just um, start to read off a few. Um, so one person has asked, um, Sir, I listen to your lectures and they're extremely emotional and touching. What are the African leaders doing about this free wisdom that you give? Have you approached them? And if you have, what do you say? Many African leaders are now responding to some of the issues that we've raised. I can mention a few African leaders who I believe are beginning to think in the right manner. John Joseph Pombe Magufuli in Tanzania, mm. Paul Kagame in Rwanda, President Masisi in Botswana, Hage Gengob in Namibia, to mention but a few. So in a nutshell, I am convinced that African leaders, whether they are in the political arena or in other arena, are beginning to recognize that going forward, the voices of reason must be listened to. And this is the beauty of the conversation in which we are engaged. It is a conversation that is designed to ensure that going forward, everybody is reading from the same page. Although we are likely to interpret and to appreciate leadership as political leadership, but I think that leadership goes beyond politics. It goes into the arena of commerce, in the academia, and in other areas, African leaders are responding. But you know that in an environment such as this, there will always be those who think that the message we are putting forth threatens their positions. They are those. We see some of the leaders who are not responding to our messages. Paul Bia in Cameroon, Alpha Conde in Guinea, Conakry, Alison Watara 
in La Côte d'Ivoire. People like Lu Ejalungu in Zambia. These are leaders who think that we should not be saying what we are saying, but we will continue to say it because the truth is the truth. Even when you are a minority of one, the truth is the truth. And it must be spoken without fear or favor. And speak it, we shall. Thank you so much for that response. So we have another question that's asking, um, looking at all the mistakes our past and current political elites in Africa have made, what do you think the young Africans should do in order to not make the same mistakes? How do we change the narrative? The story is told, and this is the story that as mother cow chews curd, baby cow looks at how she does it. It is the duty of the younger people to borrow the positive things that their forebearers have done and to abandon the bad things that they have engaged in. Experience is about looking at what history offers and sifting the negatives to ensure that you only embrace the positives. That is why Chinua Achebe, writing as early as 1958, said, he was only 22 himself, he said, and where are the young suckers that will grow when the old bananas die? It is your duty to identify the positives and embrace them and to ignore the negatives. John Garang de Mabior, whom I had the privilege of working with in my younger days, told me at one time, as you walk through the avenue of history, there are two cups in your hand. One is the cup of mistakes and one is the cup of the positive things that you do. Always make sure that the cup of the positive things is heavier than the cup of the negative because that is what history requires of you. And at an appropriate time, abandon the path, the path of the negatives and embrace the cup of the positives. Young people embrace the positive things that we do and jettison the negatives that your forebearers may have engaged in. Thank you. So I love um, what you said there. And, and in its essence, it sounds like you're saying that it's important to, you've already spoken about the importance of recognizing history, understanding what has taken place in order to learn, but in order to forge even more forward, we need to sift out those negative elements from that and build a new narrative for ourselves. So thank you very much. Um, our next question um, is, how can the younger generation of Africans approach the current trend of new colonization from China? Resist it. China is, if we are not careful, the next colonizer. And they are very subtle because they are attacking the mind. If you go to any serious African university today, you'll find something called the Confucius Institute. The Confucius Institute provides an environment where young Africans are taught about Chinese culture and are taught about not only Chinese culture, but they also taught the language Mandarin. My own suggestion is to embrace what Ngugiwa Thiongo of Kenya said in his famous novel, The River Between. In his main character, in his book called Waiyaki, he told him, go and learn the ways of the white man, but do not be a white man. Learn his ways that we may know how he thinks. Because when you, once you know how he thinks, then you will know how to avoid his dangerous activities. So let us understand the Chinese. Let us watch their television. Let us watch CGTN and CNC and let us learn all the things. But we should only do so in order to ensure that they do not manipulate us. When we trade with them, we must ask ourselves the fundamental question, what is in it for us? The law is still clear. The law is the law of the jungle. 
survival of the fittest and the dying of the least suitable. Let us not be the least suitable. Let us be in the arena to win. It is the duty of the young people to ensure that this time round, we are not subdued. Thank you. So um, we have a lot of questions, so I'll try and get through them all. Um, and I'd encourage people to send in more questions um, on our YouTube comments as well. Um, so our next question is, what is your view on the current developments in the Horn of Africa and the pursuits of economic inter integration being worked on by Ethiopia, Eritrea and Somalia, and hopefully by Sudan after elections? In fact, my worldview is a little bit wider. Africa has now come up with what is called the African Continental Free Trade Area. And the Africa Continental Free Trade Area brings together almost all the 54 African countries. It will begin to operate out of Accra in Ghana on the first day of January, the year 2021. And what it seeks to do is to eliminate all the tariff and non-tariff barriers and if that happens, the African continent will be the largest market in the continent of Africa with nearly 1.3 billion people in that particular area. I hold the view that if we are able as an African people to ensure that we begin to trade within and amongst ourselves, then we can improve our agriculture we can improve our health sector, we can improve our pharmaceutical sector, we can improve our manufacturing sector, we can begin to add value so that our cocoa is not taken to the Netherlands, Switzerland or the Netherlands, so that our gold is not taken to Antwerp, so that our diamond is not taken to Antwerp, so that our rare earth is not taken to Shenzhen and, and Beijing, so that our timber is not taken to Malaysia. We can do all that within ourselves. And I look forward to January 2021 when my friend Wamkele Mene will be the first Secretary General and we will be supporting him and Africa will never be the same again. Africa will be in the orbit of development. I have no doubt in my mind that it shall come to pass. And you younger generation, this is your turn because history has demonstrated not once, not twice, that civilizations rise on the shoulders of our young men and women. And you are our young men and women. Go out there and amaze the world. Thank you. I too am looking forward to that time. Um, so thank you for inspiring hope in us. It can be difficult, especially in recent events that you can see that there are young people fighting, fighting so much to see this change. But it's so inspirational for you to kind of instill that belief in us that we should still fight that fight in order to have an Africa that we can call our own. Um, so our next question um, is asking, is religion a trap to us? Is it mental slavery? Why do we invest so much in religion rather than in education? A prayer without action is superstition. And religion has been used throughout the ages as an instrument of pacifying the population. And when I talk about religion, I'm talking about organized religion, the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the Methodist Church, the Pentecostal Church, the Islamic faith. That is very different from spirituality. And I'm suggesting to us in Africa that we must now be in a position to make a distinction between religion and spirituality. Africans are some of the most spiritual beings on earth but religion was introduced and played its negative role in pacifying the continent of Africa. Our brand of Christianity and our brand of Islam must be a brand of Christianity and a brand of Islam that is designed to address our very needs as a people so that we are not a people who are subdued and hypnotized in a negative manner, who believe that the things that require effort will be earned through prayer and fasting. Even God himself says, go ye and subdue the world and by the sweat of thy brow, 
thou shall live. Effort is what we need. Religion, if misunderstood, is a negative influence. Thank you. I think we're going to have our last two questions for the evening. Is that sound right, Nana? Okay, so we... Um, our second, to, our second to last question um, is asking, what are your thoughts on the projects endorsed by the Africa Diaspora Development Institute under Ambassador Dr. Arakana? What role do you think Africans in the diaspora should play in Africa free trade? I'm very clear in my mind that some of our best men and women are resident outside of the mother continent. They are to be found in Brazil. They are to be found in the United States of America. They are to be found in Europe. They are to be found in the Caribbean. And these men and women are trained in every sector in the economy in Africa. If Africa is to grow, our sons and daughters in the diaspora must find a foothold. I, they are for support my sister Arikana Jihombori Kwao and her efforts without equivocation, because I believe that is well intentioned. What we need to do is to synergize and to work together and to prioritize the things that will have a positive impact. I support. Final question, Abigail. Okay, um, oh, it's just going to be hard to pick the last one because there are so many. Um, okay, I guess this is a more personal question to yourself. So, Professor, having vast experience in leadership and Africa's history, why are you not participating in the politics of Africa? There is the confusion that one, what is politics? This is a question that people don't quite answer. They think that politics is about occupation of public office. But I keep on asking them, who is in the United States of America, the greatest African American who ever lived? Martin Luther King Jr. Which political office did he occupy? Who is the greatest Indian that ever lived? Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the Mahatma. Which political office did he occupy? It is not always true that leadership must be positional. I am in politics in a different way, influencing processes to the best of my ability. Well, Thank you so much for giving us um, all those answers. I'm sure everyone is satisfied by those and I think you wrapped up really nicely. So it's been a pleasure speaking to you tonight. Yeah. So it seems like Nana might be having some technical issues. Oh, he's back on. Okay. Nana? Yes, yeah, seriously. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, I don't know. I was locked out. And so we just want to bring this program to a close. And I just want to thank you so much for your time, for your patience, for, you know, I know it's midnight in Kenya, but you, you've stayed um, throughout the night to make sure that this program has come to a, a good close. And for all of you who joined, um, the video is on YouTube. Obviously, you can keep watching. And we, we plan to come back with, with real people talking about real issues and trying to find real, uh, real solutions. And if we can challenge your thinking, if we can inspire your thinking and we can bring the change you need, that's what we, we aim to achieve here. And we look forward to having you next time on Real Talk with Nana. Again, Prof, thank you so much. Have a good night. Um, thank you. Family, and we look forward to having you again. Thank you so much. Thank you very you. much. Have a good evening. <laughs> thank you. God bless you. Bye, Prof. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your humility, boss. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
Scientists just discovered what Big Mama taught you a long time ago, that there's a relationship between a change in weather and joints. I go visit my grandmother, sweetie, in Berkeley. Once I cross the bridge, get to Berkeley, here's what happens. I knock on her door. She opened the door. Darling, welcome. So good to see you. I said, sweetie, it's good to see you. How are you? She said, darling, it's not, I'm not doing too well. It's about to rain. I said, sweetie, what are you talking about? It's about to rain. And we are in a drought. The weatherman said it ain't going to rain for a few days. Sweetie, I don't care what the weatherman said. I know it's about to rain. I said, sweetie, what are you talking about it ain't gonna rain yes it's gonna rain she said I said well how do you know it's gonna rain sweetie she said because I feel it in my in my knees there, there's something going on in my knees that lets me know there's about to be a shift in the atmosphere there's something going on in my knees that lets me know there's about to be a change in the climate and all I came here to tell y'all is it's time to take a knee in America shift in the atmosphere when we take a knee 